uh, very uh, alert to the things that I tell you to study. Because if you studied the, the homework, the written homework, and you crushed it, you also crushed the problem on the test. Okay? And uh, I can't tell you what's going to be on the test, but I can tell you what to study in order to do well on the test. So, uh, by the way, Leon Chisholm, are you here? Leon? Okay. Um, right, so let's clear this away. Uh, uh, let's start this one. Um, so let's use a dot for the center of mass uh, for bumblebee X. Uh, the weight force, first vector you draw in, straight downward. It's in blue. Uh, there it is. Now, it's a ramp problem, so you want to break it down into the components of the weight force that are perpendicular to the ramp and parallel to the ramp because the, uh, the uh, question was how large is the normal force uh, on the ramp, uh, from the ramp on Bumblebee? And you can get that by doing the breakdown of the weight force. So here's W perpendicular, okay? And here's W parallel. And you can see from the, um, you know, from this, the, the ramp down here that, you know, this, this little one is parallel and this bigger component is perpendicular to the ramp. I want to, in case you got messed up with your triangles, I want to point out something that you may not realize. When you're doing this, the right triangle is away from the weight force vector. The weight, the right triangle is right here, okay? So if you make your right angle attached to the weight vector, it's going to come out straight to the left here, and that will be wrong, okay? And it's tricky as all get out because you look at the ramp, and you look at, you know, the ramp and this triangle here, this components triangle for the weight force, they're essentially uh, similar triangles. Uh, but they're kind of backwards and flipped. So you can't just, you know, you know, copy the ramp. It should look like the ramp, however. Now, uh, to get the, uh, the normal force, you copy the uh, W perpendicular. So this is the red. So I made a red copy, all right? And then actually, I'm going to ease it up here so this now it's pointing perpendicular and away from the ramp. Okay, so that red vector N, that's my normal vector, it's equal in size to W perpendicular. So if I can figure out what W perpendicular is, I can figure out, at least magnitude-wise, uh, how big the, uh, the normal force is. So you start with the weight force. Uh, that's the uh, dark blue uh, line segment down here, okay? So it's the hypotenuse of the right triangle. Uh, and then we'll do some trig on that. But let me stop here and give you a question. I want you to type in the number that you remember, if you, if you, you know, remember, do as, as well as you can, the number that you remember calculating for the normal force, and then I'll calculate it for you. Let's see, let me get my... Cursor back over here. Okay, go ahead. Hit the refresh key and, and then type in your number. Hit refresh and, and you'll get it. Just to the best of your recollection, I just want to kind of take a, a survey. Everybody, yeah, run it up. And hey, you guys, everybody's going to get a point on this, so just t just type in what you remember. Question: Do I want what? Just give me a whole number. So it'll be somewhere between ten thousand and zero. Not much of a hint, but 
But if you don't remember, it's all right. I'll, you know, you'll get points. I just want to kind of see if you. All right, uh, 20 seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Um, let's take a look at the. So here are the results. Uh, the answer is ninety-five oh nine. A couple of you misremembered. Some of you may have typed in 9508, but you didn't write up. And that appears to be all the answers for this one. Uh, Danny Scaff, are you here? Danny? Danny Scaff, S-K-A-F? You're here? Okay. All right, so let's continue with the, uh, here's the derivation, W perpendicular. It's just uh, the hypotenuse times the cosine of uh, 14 degrees. And hopefully, and it, the, the main thing is it's the same strategy as what you did on the homework. And the homework was a little bit different mass, but the strategy was the same. And hopefully, it sounds, I, I know I'll talk to a few of you after the um, exam, you did um, use the same strategy. Uh, and I'll just tell you, you know, when I was in grad school, we, and you guys, a lot of you are trying to get into med school. And if you do get into med school, dental school, physical therapy school, etc., you're going to get, Uh, you're going to get some Whopper exams. Now, I had a friend that went to uh, med school, to, you know, well, he went to dental school. The first two years are like the first two years of med school. And he was telling me some of the multiple choice questions were like out of, they were sick. You know, he had like 14 options and then he had to pick two or three and then, you know, and, 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 and then fill it in on the scan file or whatever. And he said it was just, it was nerve wracking. When I was in grad school, it's a little different for physics. We have written problems mostly. And so and when I was in grad school, where I went to grad school, we had a qualifying exam, which meant you were qualified for grad school either to get a master's or to try for the PhD program. And so I, I took that my spring break in my first year all written problems. And then and I did, I, I, I crushed it and I, I got a PhD pass. So then they asked me to be in the PhD program. And so I said, okay, I'll try it. And so I, I took that the first time I took that, I, I passed it. Um, but when we were studying for both of those exams, what we did was problems. And I was talking to a student that said, yeah, I went over uh, the homework about 50 times to make sure I got it right. And just to, and and that is what we did. You know, we had some what the professors would do. In, and this is in physics. I don't know if they would do it in in med school or whatnot. But in physics, they would release the problems from and solutions from the past five years. And so as a study pack, and so all of us grad students got them, and we learned those problems. You know, it wasn't every problem in the world, but it was five years worth. And the PhD written exam was four days uh, for, for eight hours per day of written problems. It was very, very rough. And, uh, but anyway, so, we, so it was like doing reps in the gym. 
All right, so you guys working on homework um, five, the Bumblebee tilt test um, was like a rep. And I know some of you did several reps before you came in to take the exam. And it just so happened that it would, and I'll just, I'll just add another thing here. On, on those, you know, those study packs that they would give us of the previous five years, inevitably there would be some professor that, you know, all the professors in the faculty would contribute problems to the written test. So inevitably there would be a problem for four years ago that a, a professor this year put into the test almost verbatim. And so when you see it, you say, okay, doom, doom I'm, you know, I got it. Bing, bang, bow. And so when you're doing, so what I did with you guys was something like that. Give you the ability to do some reps and then give you a slight variation. And hopefully uh, there's a lot of people that crushed it. Um, I have another uh, question that I want to ask you uh, before we go. Let me put my, uh, get my cursor over here. Come on, baby. Okay, so there's the answer to that. I want to ask you a multiple choice question. So, uh, so, and this is verbal too. So uh, verbal, um, A is yes, B is no. Uh, were the formulas in the matching enough for you? Or did you want more for, did you think you, you needed more formulas to fill out the test, to, to finish the test? So yes, don't, don't, just type in an answer. Type in A for yes, B for no. It's, like, it's just, and this, this again, is going to be a multiple choice or it's a public opinion. So you'll get two points off of this one. Or you'll get one point off this one. So do you think, you know, because I didn't put a, a huge number of formulas on there, fewer than I could have, but I thought that they were sufficient, but you vote yes or no if you thought they were sufficient or not sufficient. 10 seconds to vote, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Oh my goodness. Forty-nine percent yes, fifty-one percent no. Now that is interesting. That's interesting. Well, we'll we'll keep talking about that little uh, little issue. All right, let's do some new stuff. Uh, this is from uh, chapter six point three. Centripetal forces. I've already done some annotations in there that you can, and, and this is actually one of them. They say that there are many physical systems that produce circular motion. Any force or combination of forces can, can, can cause a centripetal radio, radial acceleration. And that is true. And I want to emphasize that in today's lecture. Um, they give these examples. A tether ball's rope. You know, a tether ball, you know, if, if you, know, you know how to play tether ball, like Napoleon Dynamite stuff. Um, the, the rope puts some tension on the ball, and it keeps it going in a circular motion, you know, whatever it is. Okay? And so that provides centripetal newtons. Uh, the moon's force of gravity on Earth. Earth's force of gravity on the moon. Mutual interaction of gravitation. And uh, that's another version of force that can give you some mv squared over r. Skates on the floor of a skating rink. You know, so if you're, you know, I've, I've skated on ice, but I've never, and I could ski like the wind, but uh, I've, I've never actually skated uh, on a, in a skating rink, you know, with a wooden floor, you know, regular skate, roller skates. Raise your hand if you've done that, which, okay. I feel deprived, but... <laughs> But anyways, although, you know, one time I did get some rollerblades. Oh, my goodness. I fell on my burp, and, and that was the last of the rollerblade experiment. Oh, man. Because I, I didn't know what I was doing. Anyway. 
so uh, roadway, traction, of course, on a vehicle. Uh, test tube in a centrifuge, the forces on a test tube from the machinery of the, of the centrifuge, which I assume most everyone in here has seen or used in lab. So, uh, so any of those, any of those, you know, and that's a wild variety of courses. So um, I, I developed this picture here to show you that, you know, the MA side uh, over here is like a, you know, perfectly symmetric garden. You measure everything over there. You measure the mass. You measure distances and times, and you compute velocities and then acceleration. And it's all, you know, based on measurable quantities. Now, over here is the wild variety of the physical world, all the different kinds of forces. You know, so this is, so this, that's why I put up this, you know, this is the famous, uh, who here is from New York City? Anybody? One person? One? Do you ever see those smokestacks on the East River? Those, those ones? Man, it's, they're spooky looking, you know. And uh, those are the famous four smokestacks in uh, Queens along the East River to symbolize this wild variety of different forces um, that can give you some centripetal newtons, you know. So uh, whether it's, you know, electromagnetic or if it's, um, you know, gravitational newtons, uh, nuclear and, uh-oh, crop circles. That's also something that the aliens measure. But... Uh, all those different forces were, you know, they're, they're all over there on the left side. So I want you to think of the MV squared over R as something that you can use for any circular motion, no matter if it's produced by a rope or a gravitational interaction or the, uh, the elect electrical force between an electron and a proton. MV squared can be applied to all of them. It has been. Fruitfully. Now, another thing I want to mention to you is uh, just a, a, a passing remark about 6-4. Now, we're going to bypass 6-4, but the Coriolis force is kind of interesting, and you might, and it's not a very long section. Uh, you might want to dip in and, and uh, just read about that if you, especially if you like, you know, if you like thinking about studying hurricanes and stuff, because you know, the Coriolis force is the reason that. Uh, hurricanes spin one way in the northern hemisphere and spin the other way in the in the southern hemisphere, and then you know high pressure systems spin opposite to what hurricanes do, uh, and so that's in the Coriolis force. So it's a it's a little bit of reading that you know is, is optional for you, and it, it's kind of interesting. Now here's a visual summary of the measurables on the MA side and the quantities that we uh, compute from the measurables, first of all, the radius of the circle, and how long it takes to make one revolution, for instance. All right, so basic distance and time. Now, if it's circular, all you need is the radii, and you can figure out the, cir the circumference. Divide that by the time you have the speed. All right, and so you have a velocity vector that you can construct perpendicular, uh, excuse me, tangent to the circle and perpendicular to the radius uh, wherever you want it. So this is a picture of a tennis ball on the end of a string. All right, so the the velocity can be computed and, and sketched in, and so can the uh, centripetal acceleration. All right, it's toward the center, and the magnitude of it is given by this formula that we worked out. Uh, earlier, uh, I, I guess the, uh, last Friday, using uh, similar triangles and stuff. So uh, now, so this is just a, a, a visual recap to remember, you know, that the V squared over R applies to any circle. And the interesting thing is that Sir Isaac Newton leveraged his understanding of centripetal force in order to exert leverage um, on the whole idea of, uh, uh, of 
universal gravitation. So um, here's the scoop on, on what Sir Isaac Newton accomplished. In his day, you could get a decent measurement of terrestrial acceleration pre-fall, you know, like the legendary apple from the apple tree, all right? And so, um, you, you know, you can me easily measure distance in terrestrial terms, you know, from a, from a branch down to the ground, times, they had a fairly good timekeeping uh, system by the time of Sir Isaac Newton. You know, Galileo invented the pendulum clock, but he, he never actually built one. He kind of sketched it out and showed that it has to work properly. Um, but the first guy to, to build one was uh, a Dutchman called Christian Huygen, Christian Huygens. And, uh, but that was just before uh, Sir Isaac Newton. So they, they had a TikTok grandfather clock to use for times. They could also estimate the moon's centripetal acceleration. You know, so they could figure out V squared and, and R fairly well. They knew the distance to the moon as a, as a multiple of Earth's diameter. So in other words, they, they knew, you know, a proportional diagram. You know, they'd worked out the proportions. And they actually, by uh, Sir Isaac Newton's time, had a pretty good uh, idea of the diameter of Earth and the radius and the, and the circumference and so forth. But um, it's, it's also true that the ancient Greeks had a, had a decent estimate. It wasn't as nice as during Sir Isaac Newton's day, but it was, it was actually close to the, the, you know, the received thing. They didn't have much uh, precision, the Greeks, uh, but they, they knew what they were doing. They, you know, they measured it in, you know, using shadows and deep wells in Egypt and you know, timing the sunlight and stuff like that. And they got a good... A value for that. So we knew the distance. And of course, the moon's orbital time was known, you know, 27.3 days for one lap. All right, so they convert that to seconds, and you can figure out meters per second for each lap of the moon around the Earth. And so, so you can figure out V squared over R for the moon, and you can figure out the free fall velocity. Now, the, the apple fall the, from the apple tree. You know, that is a centripetal acceleration, but not for circular, um, for a circular orbit. Um, the, the apple's going straight toward the center. It's in free fall. Um, and so, it, so it's not circular, but it's, it's definitely um, a centripetal uh, force and a centripetal acceleration. So what he's, he, he found that he calculated all these things up, and he found that the centripetal acceleration uh, of the moon was one thirty six hundredth of G. And he knew that the radius of the moon's orbit was about 60 times Earth's radius. All right, so the distance from the apple to the center of the Earth is one unit, and the distance of the moon to the center of the Earth is 60 of the same unit, 60 Earth radii. So 60 and 3,600, 3,600 and 60, they're squares, right? One's a square, you know, 3,600 is a square of 60. So Sir Isaac Newton said, fellas, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is not a coincidence. Because he was thinking mathematically, and let's get down to what he was thinking about mathematically. You know, so he, he said, you know, I think it's the same force, and it depends on only two physical factors that need to be measured. One, the mass of each object, All right? So how many kilograms? You know, how many water bottles? And we did not know that for the Earth or the moon until mm, maybe 100 years after Isaac Newton died, but eventually we figured out how to do that measure the mass of the Earth. The other physical measurement uh, that went into it was distance, center to center. So center of the moon to center of the Earth, which is 60 Earth radii, approximately. And then center of Earth to the center of the apple, which is approximately one Earth radius. Okay, and those are the, the physical um, uh, measurements that control the size of the force. 
And he knew that the more mass, or he conjectured that the more mass, um, the more force. So two heavier objects would you know, have more force between them. He also said that if, if they're separated uh, by more distance, the force would be weaker, all right? So if you have a big distance, but your overall computation is smaller, that means your distance is probably in the denominator of a fraction, all right? And so that's what he, so it, what he worked out was this formula. And he said that the force of gravity is equal to a constant, capital G, times the product of the two masses that are attracting each other. It's always an attractive force. Divided by the distance, but not distance to the first power, distance to the second power. And he was tipped off to the exponent here because of the non-coincidence of 60 and 3600, the squares. The square of the, uh, of the, uh, the radius, you know, 60 squared is equal to 3,600 comes from this. The 3,600 comes in from this one, okay? And another way of saying that is that the acceleration of the moon um, or the, the um, acceleration of the apple on Earth is uh, 3,600 times larger than the centripetal acceleration of the moon. So if you think of the, you know, if you read his book, Principia, the uh, mathematical principles of natural philosophy, he's, he's, he, his very first page, he's, he's setting up to talk about universal gravitation. And he may, he has all the, the proportion, he has the dis, you know, he's got all kinds of distances between Paris and, and the North Pole and, and stuff. Um, and in there, and uh, and uh, so it's kind of interesting. So he's working with the, the proportions and stuff, 60 squared, and, and uh, you know this this is his law. This is the force law for the law of universal gravitation. It is extremely well verified. Now I was reading um, on the internet about one of the hidden figures that was uh, involved with um, GPS a lady named Gladys West, and I'm, I'm going to do some more reading up on her. But the GPS system is essentially a Albert Einstein general theory of relativity system. Sir Isaac Newton could not have used GM1 over M2 divided, or GM1 M2 over R squared. He could not have used that to construct a GPS to the accuracy that we now have. But Einstein's theory of uh, general relativity uh, could do it. And that's what the GPS, it's essential to GPS. Uh, but with this, you can definitely shoot something at the moon and hit the moon. You know, it's, it's pretty good for most stuff that NASA does. But if you want to put something on a dime, um, you know, drop something down a gopher hole, uh, you know, like Luke Skywalker, you got to have GPS. Or the force, you gotta have the force, either that, I guess, if you're in, in Hollywood. Now, uh, one last thing. In this formula, you can make a note on this, capital G, this is known as the gravitational constant or Newton's constant, or Newton's gravitational constant. And in a way, it is a conversion factor because if you think about it, um, the, the quantity M1, M2, that's kilograms squared in the numerator. And in the denominator, it's meter squared. So kilogram squared per meter squared, that ain't a Newton. A Newton is kilogram meters per second squared. So capital G is the, is the numerical factor that converts it into um, uh, Newtons of force. And, uh, you, and, you know, capital G, it's a constant of nature. And you can look it up in the, in the front cover of the textbook or, you know, anywhere on the Internet. You know, it's uh, like 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 in the metric system. And that's Newtons uh, per kilogram, Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. But 
as a as a conversion factor, it's something like the way I like to explain it is. Uh, something you may remember from high school or, or even middle school, you know, when you're converting from Celsius to uh, Fahrenheit, which is a pain in the perp. I hate it a lot. I never teach it. I never expect my students to know it. But if you remember a little bit about it, of the moments of pain that you had to do with converting, there's a, there's a factor of five-ninths and nine-fifths. And then you got to add 32, and you got to subtract 32, and stuff like that. Now the nine fifths, five ninths, comes from the factor that the distance in degrees uh, for Fahrenheit between boiling and melting is 180 degrees, but in the Celsius system, uh, it's 100 Celsius degrees. So 180 over 100 is 9 is uh, nine over 5. And then the reciprocal of that is 5 ninths. So every time you, you convert from uh, Celsius to Fahrenheit or vice versa, you're dealing with this factor of 5 ninths. Um, it's the same same phenomena, you know, boiling water, melting, melting ice, uh, but different uh, scales. And so um, G is like that. Third comment about G. It is more than a conversion factor for convenience. It is actually tied up to the structure of space-time. And we didn't realize this until we started working deep into the theory of general relativity. For instance, the point of no return around a black hole is called the event horizon. And once you cross that event horizon going inward, um, you ain't coming out, not even light. If you take a, a flashlight and shine it outwards at the speed of light, it can't get out of the event horizon. If you're outside the event horizon, theoretically, if you have a good enough rocket, you can get away to safety. Uh, but not if you're inside the event horizon. Now, the size of the event horizon is a multiple of the mass of the, of the uh, star that formed the black hole. Right? So a star blows up. In a supernova, the iron core of the supernova collapses, and, um, and if it's big enough and heavy enough, it'll keep collapsing and never stop and collapse down to zero volume and form a black hole. The size of the event horizon is a factor of two uh, times g times the mass of the star divided by the square of the speed of light. Yeah. The square of the speed of light, c squared, just like in E equals mc squared. Yeah. And so, and that's just for black holes. When we study the overall, for instance, the Big Bang Theory, the, the, or, or what we call the early universe, um, the factor g is, c controls the expansion, is one of the factors controlling the expansion of the universe. And so it is way, way more than just a conversion factor. And in fact, it is intimately tied up with the space-time structure uh, of our universe itself. Now, let's talk about satellites. This is, this is actually a little bit deeper into uh, chapter six. Um, and what we're gonna do here is put together some concepts of universal gravitation uh, and uh, centripetal force. So. So let's think of a satellite orbiting the Earth, the Earth having mass capital M and the satellite having lowercase m subscript s, you know, so some kind of a spacecraft. Now, NASA, NASA wants to set the distance, you know, that when they say, well, we want this thing to orbit at such and such an altitude, such and such a radius above the center of the Earth. Okay, and they have to use rockets to do it, all right? Now, at that altitude, if it's going to be a circular orbit anyways, it's going to have to have a certain speed. Otherwise, it'll fall. And if it's too fast, it'll go into an elliptical orbit, right? which is all right if you want an elliptical orbit. But if you're in a circular orbit, you can use the centripetal force formula. Now, here we go. Right? The F equals MA. Smokestacks on the left. English garden perfectly measured out and symmetric on the right. So over here is gravity. 
And over on the right is the centripetal measurable acceleration and actually measurable force, I should say. That's a centripetal force. All right. So smokestacks on the left, uh, symmetric garden on the right. Now, notice anything about that equation. This is the centripetal force on the satellite that keeps it on its circular orbit. Notice anything about that? What do you notice? Inverse, too complicated. What do you notice? Yeah. The mass of Earth is capital M. Okay, that's up here. Uh, yep, satellite mass cancels out. Bing. All right, so let's let's burn those babies out of there. All right. So nice. So here here's something interesting. What this means is that all the accelerations and stuff, it only depends on uh, the size of your orbit and the mass of the Earth. You know, capital M doesn't cancel out. But here's what you got left over. You cancel out the M subscript S. Bing. This controls all orbiting objects, for Earth anyways. Now, uh, we got some factors of R there on both sides. So let's cross multiply and get the R uh, squared away. So we got GM over R and V squared. On the right hand side. So now it doesn't, it, now we've, you know, mixed the garden and the smokestacks together. But, but now look at that. What that tells you is that the orbital speed and the radius, if you have one, you can calculate the other. If you know capital G and the mass of the Earth, which we know. All right, so let's work on this a little bit further. So, Say that you, you know the radius um, R for the orbit that you want. You can figure out the required speed and then design your, your rockets to deliver that much speed because a rocket is really expensive and you got to, you know, you get diminishing returns with size because, you know, if you want to get a lot of speed, you got to buy a big rocket or build a big rocket. Now, an example of this is a spy satellite. You want the, the spy satellite um, at a certain radius, low enough to keep an eye on the Russians, you know, and see what Vladimir Putin's got in his back pocket, uh, which we could definitely do whenever whenever he comes out of, the, out of his hole. Is anybody here from Russia? Sorry about saying that about... Your, your beloved leader, but we have a lot of Russian faculty that they don't. <laughs> Anyways, so if you want to keep an eye on your mother-in-law in Russia uh, and see what she's got cooking in the kitchen. So, so in other words, specify R, build your rockets to deliver speed V. Now, the other way to do it is this. Say that you want a certain orbital speed so that it orbits Earth once per day. You know, so it's got to be at a certain orbit that the sp the orbital speed matches up the you know with the with the rotation of the Earth. You know, because the Earth is rotating or not, things will orbit around it at you know whatever pace you set. Now, um, an example of this is another kind of satellite that we have. Uh, where it, it orbits once per day. And if it's orbiting over the equator of the Earth, it's known as a geosynchronous uh, or geostationary satellite. Okay, so that's that's our communication satellites. So Dish Network, DirecTV, uh, most of your international, tel even some domestic telephone calls, radio programs that come over. Every time you see on television, you know, like ABC Eyewitness News and the, and, you know, the person at the at the studio asks a question and the reporter answers the question like a second later. That's because it's going up to the satellite and back down to the reporter and then back up to the satellite with his answer and back down to, to the transmitter. So uh, so that's what those are about. 
Now, the form of this force law is what we call inverse R squared force. And one of the interesting things about the inverse R squared force is um, using a ton of calculus, uh, you can show that it, it's infinite range. And so it really is universal. Your left earlobe is um, interacting gravitationally with the Andromeda galaxy. And the furthest galaxy and quasar that we can see, your earlobe is interacting theoretically with it, if it still exists. The dominant interaction that we have is with Earth. It's close and it's big. But we, you know, we, our planet sees interactions um, with the moon. Our planet reacts to the gravitational force of the moon. Anybody think about how, how we could see that? What visible effect is due to... What? Raise your hand. Yeah. Tides. The sun. The sun is also large enough that we can measure the effect of the tides uh, in the oceans of Earth from the sun. And so they compete. You know, the, 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 the tide from the sun can cancel out a little bit of the tide from the moon. Let's keep going. We got another? Yeah. Uh, that's up for debate. I don't. I, you'd have to calculate that. The question was, um, if you if you if you go up to the top of Mount Everest, is gravity a little bit weaker up there? Yes. At the um, bottom of the Mariana Trench in a submarine, theoretically, it's a little bit stronger there. But I'd have to calculate that because. But here's the here's the the upshot of that question. On our planet, from the top of Everest to the bottom of the deep blue sea, there's not enough variation in R squared to see a huge amount of difference. And that's why we have the, universe, the uh, terrestrial constant, G. 9.8 meters per second free fall uh, acceleration up on Mount Everest, the bottom of the deep blue sea, and everywhere in between. Now, if you go a little bit higher than that, you'll start noticing it. If you have a a high precision accelerometer, you'll see variations all along the way, you know, and they use, they actually use that for prospecting uh, minerals and stuff. You know, they fly airplanes through with a gravitometer and they find different uh, rock formations and stuff. All right, it's 4.20. Uh, we'll talk about Johannes Kepler when we get back on Friday. Oh, uh, what, hold on, hold on. Uh, there was one more thing that everybody wants to know the homework situation so let me dude let me get through this thing here hold on the homework situation the homework situation no written homework for friday but but do continue reading Partly. Now do you see what I could tell you? Okay. Hi. Uh, 